Welcome, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. Morning, everybody. Good to see everybody. And Brian asked me to give this talk and it stemmed from a conversation we were having, which is that the STD Prevention Training Center has a clinical consultation line. And since these new guidelines came out in December, they've basically just, the consultation line has blown up with questions. And so Brian thought it might be good to bring the questions here because they might be questions lots of us have. I would be so open to hearing any different questions you all have in the chat box afterwards or in our time to do Q&A afterwards. We're in a weird limbo time because we've been awaiting the 2020 updated CDC STD guidelines for a while now. I guess the CDC was busy in 2020. I'm not really sure what was happening, but they're not ready yet. And they are ready, but they're not being released probably until earliest summer 2021. And I would not be surprised if it's, you know, third or fourth quarter of the year. But they did give us new gonorrhea guidelines. And so we're going to talk about those. Now, so I have no disclosures. So little Chlamydia says, sure feels like there are a lot of changes for me in the upcoming 2021 CDC STI guidelines. And gonorrhea says, hold my beer. So first polling question, have you started treating for gonorrhea according to the updated December 2020 gonorrhea treatment guidelines? Yes, no, I didn't know there were updated guidelines or I need coffee. And answer honestly. Okay, so about half of people are saying they are using them. A quarter are not using them yet. 6% did not know there were updated guidelines, and I'm thrilled because then you'll get to learn today, and 20% of you are smart asses. So, okay, so for more detailed information about these new guidelines, I'm going to refer you to an excellent talk by Lindley Barbie, who is one of the authors of the guidelines. She gave this talk on January 28th, and it's available at the UW STD PTC website. You need a password and you have to enter it twice, but it's right there. Also, the CDC did a treatment guideline webinar about all the proposed changes to the guidelines. There's a video and a transcript and a Q&A, and they're all listed there. So another polling question. You get a call from the lab telling you that the patient you tested for STIs yesterday has a positive gonorrhea net. Before deciding on treatment, what do you need to know? Site of infection, patient's weight, drug allergy history, chlamydia test result, or all of the above. All right. And most people said all of the above with a smattering of other answers. And I know it seems silly sometimes when you ask all of the above questions, but the answer is all of the above. And I just think it's really important because in the old guidelines, we didn't really have to think about all of these. There was some difference based on site of infection. They never asked us the patient's weight before. We did need to know about drug allergy history, and we didn't used to care about the chlamydia test result because the recommendation for the gonorrhea treatment was the same either way. So things have changed, and just to keep that list in the back of your mind when you're treating for gonorrhea now. In 2015, we were told that for uncomplicated gonococcal infection of the cervix, urethra, or rectum, we could give 250 milligrams of ceftriaxone and a gram of azithro. And alternative therapy was cefixime, 400 milligrams, plus one gram of azithro. But that's out the window now. They also said that for uncomplicated gonococcal infection of the pharynx, that you should use ceftriaxone and azithro. No alternatives were listed. And test of cure for any other regimen was recommended after 14 days. That's also gone. So what did we learn in December 2020? Well, the CDC said that for uncomplicated gonococcal infections of the cervix, urethra, or rectum, and in addition, this applies to the pharynx also, is that we should give ceftriaxone 500 milligrams IM as a single dose for people weighing less than 150 kilograms, and for those weighing more than that, one gram of IM ceftriaxone should be administered. And if chlamydia is not excluded, that you should treat for chlamydia with doxycycline 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days, except during pregnancy, azithromycin as a single dose is recommended. 
So the major changes, just to review, are to remove co-administration of azithromycin, increase the ceftriaxone dose to 500 milligrams, and in some cases, one gram. And this is the only regimen recommended for pharyngeal infection. Other significant changes include a test of cure is recommended for pharyngeal gonorrhea regardless of treatment regimen at 7 to 14 days with NAT or culture, and CDC says, if possible, both. The downsides of this recommendation is that there is a risk of false positives, and we'll talk more about this. There's a cost to doing extra testing. It's an additional visit in most cases. I know some places are doing home testing, but in most cases it's an additional visit. And swab shortages. We've had a major problem with swab shortages for the nucleic acid amplification tests this year, and that seems to be improved or improving, but still it could happen again. So I also just want to point out, I mentioned before the clinical consultation network from the STD Prevention Training Center. Everyone is eligible to use this. I know a lot of you ask Brian and, and me some of these questions, and we love hearing your questions. So we are not pushing you towards the clinical consultation network, but if you have questions that are specifically STD-related, it's a great resource. Tell your colleagues and your trainees. Okay. So now we're getting to the Q&A section. This is the first I'm hearing about this. I just treated a patient, and these are all real questions, by the way. I just treated a patient for rectal gonorrhea with ceftriaxone, 250 milligrams IM a couple days ago. Do I need to call them back in? So polling question, what would you do for a patient who was treated three days ago for rectal gonorrhea with 250 milligrams of ceftriaxone? Would you bring them back in for another dose of 250? Would you bring them in for a dose of ceftriaxone 500? Would you not give any additional treatment and do a test of cure at two weeks? No additional treatment and routine rescreening at three months. And again, just a reminder, these were all questions that came in through the clinical consultation line. Okay, so I will also say about most of the questions that I'm answering today, there is not a prescribed answer. So we're all going to have to use our best judgment, and I'm going to give you the best advice I can, but the CDC has not offered a lot of guidance in answering these questions to this point. So almost half of you said no additional treatment, routine rescreening at three months. I think that's probably what I would do, but we're going to talk about some nuances. A third of you said no additional treatment, do a test of cure in two weeks. A fifth of you bring back in for a dose of ceftriaxone 500, and a few people said... 250. So here's what my advice for this question is, is first, don't panic. I would think about the patient's weight now. I would consider giving an additional 250 milligrams or 500 milligrams IM of ceftriaxone if the patient were significantly overweight or obese, knowing what we know now. And I would assess the site of infection. If the patient had a pharyngeal infection, I might be more likely to give additional treatment or have them come in for a test of cure. But in most cases, I think I would just rescreen at three months or earlier. You know, instead of three months, maybe make it a little teeny bit earlier. Okay, next question. Why does the CDC say 300 pounds when 150 kilograms is 330 pounds? It was a typo. So it was supposed to say about 300 pounds because they like nice round numbers, but not writing the approximately sign. So bottom line is, it's easier to remember nice round numbers. So 150 kilograms, 300 pounds, you're gonna be fine giving one gram in that range. My clinic doesn't stock ceftriaxone and my patient is terrified of needles anyway. What are my options in this situation? Well, the CDC does give us alternative regimens for both oral and an injectable regimen. And the alternative regimens they recommend, the oral one is cefixime. That was an alternative before, if you recall, but it was 400 milligrams, and now it's 800 milligrams. And they also say you can give the regimen of gentamicin 240 milligrams IM plus azithromycin 2 grams as a single dose. You might notice that that's a change because it used to have gemifloxacin, but gemifloxacin has been perpetually unavailable, and so that has fallen off the recommendation. So... Major changes, gentamicin and azithromycin are no longer recommended for pharyngeal gonorrhea, and the cefixime dose has been increased. 
And gentamicin is no longer recommended as an alternative regimen for pharyngeal gonorrhea because there have been several studies, and I'm just highlighting one that was done here, which is by Dr. Barbie and Dr. Golden at the STD clinic here, our sexual health clinic. And basically, they looked at gentamicin compared to ceftriaxone to er eradicate pharyngeal gonorrhea, and only two of the 10 subjects were cured at the throat. And so they actually stopped the study very early because it was obvious it wasn't working. There were very similar results from another study in the Lancet last year, and so we no longer like to use that regimen at the throat. That being said, I told you there are no other alternative regimens for pharyngeal gonorrhea at the throat, so we'll talk about what we might do in the real world. Okay, my patient with pharyngeal gonorrhea was treated with ceftriaxone 500 milligrams IM, as we told you to do, and test of cure at day 10 is positive. What should I do now? Well, why is there a test of cure recommendation anyway at the pharynx? Well, the reason is, is because there have been a lot of reported failures of treating pharyngeal gonorrhea with ceftriaxone, which is what the CRO is here. And I won't go through all the cases, but just know there have been multiple cases reported of failure at the throat with ceftriaxone, even at 500 milligrams. So, and what is the appropriate time frame? Well, the CDC says seven to 14 days, but interestingly, they have done studies looking at how long it takes to clear gonorrhea at different sites using RNA-based and DNA-based NAT technology. And in these studies, it was more than seven to nine days. So in that seven to 14 day range, we are going to get false positives. So, what do you do if you have a positive pharyngeal test of cure at seven to 14 days? Well, I think the first thing I would say is don't do a pharyngeal test of cure at seven to 14 days. And I know that is what the CDC tells us to do, but I would try and push that out to 14 days and even go 14 to 21 days or 14 to 28 days, because I think it's just gonna really muddy the picture if we are doing a lot of tests of cures at seven to 14 days. And we've already seen this happen. We're getting so many questions about it and so many reports of positive tests. So the first thing I would do is talk to your patient, find out, were their partners treated? Have they been having a lot of additional sex partners or even a single additional sex partner? If reinfection seems likely, then I would repeat treatment. And then retest with culture and NAT, if possible, at 14 to 21 days. And if culture is not available and the NAT is again positive, then I would retreat with ceftriaxone 500 milligrams IM, or again, the higher dose if higher weight. And then again, then you're stuck with repeating a test of cure, hopefully again at 14 to 21 days. Okay. So here's a big one that we get. What if my patient with pharyngeal gonorrhea has anaphylaxis with cephalosporins? So in 2010, in this case, they said give two grams of azithromycin a test of cure in one week. But that's no longer the case. In 2015, for cephalosporin allergy, we were told gentamicin or gemifloxacin plus azithro, but that was only for urogenital infections. And if used for pharyngeal infections, we were supposed to perform a test of cure. But that is now out the window. That is okay for cephalosporin allergies for non-pharyngeal infections. You can use gentamicin and azithro, but you cannot use that for pharyngeal infections according to the CDC. So in 2020, what do we have? Well, if someone has a true cephalosporin allergy, they recommend gentamicin, and azithro, but that's only for urogenital infections. So what are we supposed to do if we have a real-world situation, which comes up all the time, of pharyngeal gonorrhea in the setting of a true anaphylactic ceftriaxone allergy? So the CDC gave no alternate options. They say consult ID. And P.S., they didn't tell ID what to do. So I have polled everyone who runs the STD sexual health clinic here at Harborview or King County. And I think most importantly, get as much information about the reaction to a cephalosporin or penicillin as possible. Because as we know, 
There's very little cross-reactivity between penicillin and third-generation cephalosporins, and in many cases, patients have actually received cephalosporins and penicillins before, and they just didn't even realize. So get as much information. But presuming it's a true anaphylactic septriaxone allergy, get a culture, if possible, before treating. And then what we came up with is you can either give two grams of azithro with or without gentamicin IM, test of cure at two to four weeks, ideally with NAT and culture. If the gonorrhea is resistant to azithromycin and or the gonorrhea persists at the time that you do a repeat test of cure, then you're gonna modify treatment based on the culture result. And in these patients, because this may happen again, really consider a referral to allergy for skin testing, but that only helps your future management. It doesn't help what you need to decide today in your office. And this is just a reminder of the prevalence of tetracycline penicillin or quinolone resistance. So all of these are true resistance patterns in gonorrhea. And thankfully, we haven't seen a lot of resistance per se in azithromycin cefixime and and ceftriaxone, but we are seeing emerging elevated MICs decrease susceptibility. Okay, so do I need to do a test of cure if I treat genital or anorectal gonorrhea with gentamicin? And I just wanted to review when is a test of cure needed. It's very rarely needed, but for pharyngeal gonorrhea, it is recommended regardless of regimen used at 7 to 14 days. And again, not to beat a dead horse, but we'd prefer 14 to 21 days for more accurate results. In pregnant individuals, should probably get a test of cure. I will say the CDC is a little unclear about this because in the 2015 guidelines, they say test of cure for chlamydia, but they didn't mention it for gonorrhea. And I think that's more of just an omission that was not intentional. But in general, I think pregnant individuals should have a test of cure for gonorrhea or chlamydia. And anyone who has gonorrhea or chlamydia should be retested at three months. But this is testing for reinfection, which is so common, not test of cure. Okay, 32-year-old man who has sex with women with positive urine NAT for gonorrhea. What is recommended for partner therapy? And would it matter if the patient were a man who has sex with men? I will also say I'm very sorry. I think that when we talk about STDs and just health in general, we should especially when we're talking about sexual health, we should really be talking about anatomy and not behavior. So we should be talking about partners with penises and partners with vaginas. But for just ease of speaking today, I apologize. I tried to do better about this, but in general, I really think we should be focusing on anatomy. Okay, so expedited partner therapy, EPT, or patient-delivered partner therapy, has always been We've been told it's appropriate for heterosexual patients with gonorrhea or chlamydia whose partner's treatment cannot be insured or is un unlikely. It's not appropriate for syphilis, maybe for TRIC. And it's for partners in the past 60 days, or if someone says they haven't had a partner in the last 60 days, attempt to treat the most recent partners. It's legal in most states. It's always, we've always been told it's not considered ideal for MSM because of concern for missing concurrent infections like HIV and syphilis. But the CDC has told us that they're going to be more permissive about EPT in MSM in 2021. So not that they're going to recommend it. Still, the goal is that partners should come in for testing and treatment, but that they're going to be more permissive um, and more encouraging about us doing expedited partner therapy in MSM. So there are big changes in EPT. So if partners will not or cannot come in, for testing and treatment. Empiric treatment for exposure to both gonorrhea and chlamydia is cefixime, again, the higher dose 800, and doxycycline rather than azithro. If you're exposed to gonorrhea alone, it's cefixime 800, and exposure to chlamydia alone is doxycycline for seven days. The caveat here is doxycycline has not been well studied for EPT, and if there's any concern about the partner's adherence or pregnancy, Azithromycin is acceptable. And what you just told us, we need ceftriaxone, ceftriaxone is so much better. Well, thankfully, gonococcal isolates with reduced susceptibility to cephalosporins remain exceedingly uncommon in women and men who have sex with women. But the risk is really primarily in men who have sex with men. 
at least for now, and we'll keep monitoring. Reinfection in persons with previously diagnosed gonorrhea is very high, and EPT is just a very important element of infection control among women and men who have sex with women. So we are okay with using cefixime, and we think it is safe and effective. And this is just to show that the biggest concern for emerging resistance and elevated MICs is really azithromycin, and we haven't seen as much of a change in cefixime, which are the green bars. Okay, I think I just have like one more question, Brian. 28-year-old man who has sex with men comes to clinic and says he was told by a partner he was exposed to an STD, but I don't know which one. This happens in our clinic all the time. You order three-site gonorrhea and chlamydia testing and treat with ceftriaxone 500 milligrams IM and doxycycline for seven days. His chlamydia testing comes back negative at all sites. Can you stop the doxycycline? And so the answer is that you really want to ensure that all exposed anatomic sites were tested and negative. If he had only come in and he was MSM and he had only given a urine test, I wouldn't feel comfortable stopping the doxycycline. But if all the exposed anatomic sites were tested and negative, you can discontinue the doxycycline. Doxycycline is no longer considered part of the treatment for gonorrhea. It's just treating chlamydia. So if no chlamydia, no doxycycline is needed. Practically, this has come up quite a few times. Patients come in and say, I had an exposure to gonorrhea. We treat with ceftriaxone. Then the test results come back and they also have chlamydia. So I would just say a practical point is that if chlamydia is not ruled out, you can either start doxycycline until the test results return, or I would give that patient a prescription and tell them to wait for the results. Because what we have had happen is that patients often then have to come back into clinic for their antibiotics, or if it's vice versa and you've treated for chlamydia and then the gonorrhea comes back, they have to come back. So I don't really recommend just waiting for the results if you have no idea about whether they have chlamydia or not. So that is the end. I will welcome any questions that you all have. I hope those did address some questions that may have crossed your mind during this time. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.